Now we are. It's going for real. We are live. Hello. Howdy, guys. Rex here. Hey, this is kind of bright. Did you notice that? Yes. How do I do this? Oh, shit. All right. Oh, what's the button? Do I keep clicking here? Should be. Oh. Aha. <laughs> Sorry, guys. We're adjusting the brightness level. There we go. There we go. Okay. It was blinding me. Waiting for Zeke Shoots channel to go live at 9 p.m. Hi, guys. So they're talking on there, aren't they? Yes. Rex here. We got Casey. Hi, guys. And uh, the topic of this video is... Secondary weapons. So... Yeah, a lot of folks ask this question. It's like, what else do you carry if you got your big heavy-duty bolt action? That's kind of a big clunker, you know, to carry around. And uh, sometimes you might need other stuff to get through the day, right? Yes. Yes. Okay. So, and I don't know how long this could be a relatively quick video. First thing I take is usually the death pod. Have you, you guys have seen the death pod before? Uh, yeah. It's this is really good. You, de you deploy this uh, somewhere in the area, and that'll take care of you. And then um, another thing you can have is like an Ontario Knife Works. Uh, man, I used to throw this at rocks. We're having fun, guys, okay? We'll get serious in a minute. Uh, what is this thing? Spec Plus Raider Boy. It's, uh, I don't want to stab you in the face on accident. Sorry. Yeah, back up a little bit. There we go. Look at that. Look at that. Oh, look at that. I used to throw this at boulders. I used to throw it at trees. I used to chop logs with it, dig holes. I dug stuff out of the dirt and eat it. Seriously. This is a heck of a knife right here. And they're built like a tank. I think it's carbon steel. What is the S? I don't know what the heck it is. I used to know about steel a lot. But Ontario, USA, uh, good for the money. Heavy duty as heck. And you can stab a lot of things with that. So that's a good backup deal if you have to be extra sneaky. Just stabbing things usually works very well, I would have to say. Um, another thing you can do, of course, is like for a secondary weapon, probably the most powerful weapon at your disposal as a sneaky guy with a rifle at some point will be a communication device like this, okay? You can kill a lot of bad guys with something like this. Now, it might be a radio. It might be a big old Singars, you know, atomic bomb proof radio or whatever you need to do. But if you can call in airplanes or something, it's pretty good. I heard about it. I don't know about that stuff, but that would probably work pretty good. But to get more to the point, um, what I would think that I would probably carry around is this is an incredibly handy tool right here. Uh, something like this, a silenced pistol. And a subsonic cartridge that's pretty powerful uh, to dispatch potential things that might be trying to sneak up on you. You don't want to give away your position. Like, um, what do you call this thing? Space aliens or uh, zombies, right? Yeah, obviously. Things yeah. that are politically correct that are bad guys. And this is a uh, Mark Robot. 23. Yeah, this is a Mark 23. I don't know if you guys, I'll do a review on this if you want me to. See that thing? I ain't going to point at your face, so. Because it's hot. But uh, there it is right there. And uh, I forget what this thing is called. Advanced Armament, uh, whatever the heck, Tyrant. Uh, somebody also said a Teflon frying pan uh, is an excellent <laughs> second weapon. <laughs> yeah. <Bang! laughs> so this is a good one. Uh, that's actually, this is a really, really good way to go, actually. Um, especially if you got a laser aiming module on here. This one is a Streamlight uh, TR or TLR2 IRW. Okay. And I did a, I'm going to be doing a separate review just on that piece of equipment. Uh, there's focusing slow. You got to be slow with it. Uh, but if you're wearing like uh, NBGs or something, you just turn that on. It's an invisible laser unless you're wearing the goggles or the binocular. And then you can just shoot like this and you can put the laser on whatever. And it's like deadly. And uh, this particular handgun is real accurate. Um, you know, it's got a long sight radius. The Mark 23s are cool because they got the built up sights and they're actually designed for a silencer. Uh, so they're a really, really good handgun if you're going to run one of them things. Uh, they're a little bit pricey, but you can find them used sometimes, you know, like, but they're, they're a heck of a good deal. Um, a good backup thing to have as well would be like a carbine, something very light, uh, where you have a lot of firepower in case you have to, you know, separate from contact or whatever you want to call that stuff where the bad guys try to pin you down. So something like this would be pretty good. It's just a little Mark 18. Um, and you can put a silencer on there too which is and you definitely want to run that if you can that's really really going to make it a lot harder for uh potential bad guys to see exactly maybe where you're coming from or whatever but uh this is mine of choice right here little mark 18 kind of situation and i got a pro on there uh so that's a really good way 
to back up, you know, your sniper rifle. And this is stuff that you can all carry. It's heavy. You know, dudes run around and complain about how heavy scopes and stuff are. My opinion is that you're carrying like a lot of crap anyways. Like just my rifle bag, my voodoo tactical bag with my 338 Lapua, when I got my ammo and my equipment, my peripheral stuff, and my uh, all my stuff is like, what was it, 65 or 85 pounds just for this drag bag on a big heavy duty rifle with ammunition and all that stuff with everything you're going to need. That's just that. And so if you ask guys to carry around stuff for a living, it's not a thing unless you, I don't know. I mean, for me nowadays, it probably would because I got wussy in the last few years, you know, pretty soft. But, um, you know, if you're a young man or whatever, going to be a tough guy, then just carry more stuff, right? Uh, but, yeah, definitely something like this is going to save your bacon or whatever. And uh, something like that will help you out a lot, too. So that's a good advice. Or you can get something like this. Uh, this is a little, you know, it's compact. This is something like, for example... When you're moving around a lot, uh, some of the British guys like to do it this way. When they're moving up to the FFP, they'll just have these things out. This is uh, Tavor, uh, but the British use the SA-80, right? Uh, but a little bullpup or something like the Mark 18 is what you would have until you get to your uh, objective rally point. And then you put this thing away if you're the, the shooter on the bolt action, and then you can sneak up to wherever you're going with the bolt action. And the other guy is always going to have some kind of DMR style rifle or something like that to back you up anyways. And nowadays they usually go on a three or five band team. Uh, they've been adjusting their stuff there, but this is kind of cool. Uh, this is kind of a ridiculously big scope, maybe for this uh, footprint of a rifle. This is a uh, primary arms platinum, which is actually really nice. It's like similar in quality to the really high end vortex stuff, or even some of the night force stuff in terms of like craftsmanship and it's made the same outfit in japan there it's the exact same parts and stuff uh do but it's uh, yeah sorry do, do you ever do the review on the savage 10. oh How do you guys want to hear about that thing yeah the savage 10. Mm -hmm. we, yeah we should do that you guys remember the uh what do you call that thing uh savage model 10 whatever police model it was in the 308 i had the um hud dmr reticle in there and the 4 to 14 scope and uh yeah it's doing really good like it actually shoots really straight and it's stupidly easy to hit stuff i've got a few months of footage compiled but i want to wait to release that video i'm trying to secure a deal for you guys from them guys to get you something for like maybe a better deal on shipping or like a free mount or something and uh, they're actually pretty cool with doing stuff like that so i was waiting until they finalize that and then i'll release the video so if you guys want to get free mounts or, you know, get a cheaper deal or whatever, then you can use the Rex link and it'll get you that. So those uh, stand by for those video reviews. They will be coming out soon. Those are actually good scopes for people who don't want to spend a lot of money, uh, who want something that will just work. And for people who don't have a lot of patience in terms of trying to be a, a, a nerd or a scientist. To, what the heck? Hello? It's ah! happening. Oh, sorry about that, guys. Okay. You got all the walleye on us, but guys who are trying to be uh, nerds or scientists, like that's intimidating to a lot of folks who just want to like shoot the thing at long distance. And so if you get one of those smart reticles, like an ACSS reticle or HUD reticle, it's like a $3,000 reticle and a $300 scope is what people are saying. And uh, you can shoot very effectively up to six or 800 yards with those. Uh, so that's one of my recommended choices for guys that don't want to dial it in. If you just want to hold over, then that's what I would run. And that's what's in this thing uh, for reticle. Um, but yeah, it's st standby. I, I've been meaning to release those reviews, but I want to do it with the right timing so that you guys can maybe get a bit better deal on that stuff. So. Cold Steel Gunstock War Club? Uh, what's that? Cold Steel, steel Gunstock War Club. I don't know. Are, you mean like clubbing things to Yeah, there's, they're asking questions over here, aren't they? Yeah, we can visit about whatever you guys want to. Uh, we are sitting here on the live stream after all, so that's exciting. Um, oh, I've seen a question about the death pod. I don't own a spoon. I don't have a spoon. What are they Sorry. talking about spoons for? They said that they want me to hold up a spoon to prove this is live. Oh, yeah. It's definitely live. I can hold up the death flower. Nobody wants to hear about the death flower anymore? Death flower? The death, the, the, what are, the death pod? Death pod? You guys know what this is? Who knows what this is? Who can identify this object? Hmm? Let's see if anybody can identify it. Hmm? I don't see not anything. an it's, alien. Look, they all paused because they are right? trying to know. see what it is. This is a death pod. You deploy this in your area and you set it down. 
death pod. And then this thing comes off. Yeah, what is the death pod? Actually, it's just a tripod. A really cool tripod. Well, you guys have seen this before. This is made in England. It's a roller tube, so you got the feet. I don't think they sell these anymore. Maybe they do. They're hard to find. They're like, Jesus. Sorry. Forgive me, Lord. Boop. I'm trying to be better with my dirty mouth. Uh, but, you know, years and years of being a bad guy with the language. So you got the little death pod feet here. Man, that thing is going nuts. See? These are very aggressive feet. And then you got this. Remember them snap bracelets? You want to play this game? Sure. Hey, okay, hold that. Oh. <laughs> oh, you're not going to snap it on me? Nope. Have oh. it like this. <laughs> All right. Scary. Yeah, dig that. See? So then you grab this deal. And this is the feet for your tripod, right? And then you stick them in like so. Have these guys seen this before? And they actually, uh, paratroopers been testing these out. SOCOM's been testing them. Uh, they've been mounting 240 machine guns on these things. They're pretty tough. Um, they're pretty darn cool, actually. Uh, they were even running RPA 50s off of them. How much do they cost? I don't know. I couldn't even find where to buy them. Uh, if you watch my review I did a couple of years ago when I was in England, uh, we went to Bisley. And uh, I was running an RPA rifle off one of these things. You can get it has a, this one has a precision targeting tripod adapter, which is like really refined head. If you need like a spotting scope or something, these gears are like really finely made. And they use this for laser targeting guys that are like trying to aim at something at a couple miles away. And because you need tiny adjustments and it has to be very tight and mechanically precise. So this head alone is incredible. And it's very, very well made out of good materials too, so it doesn't get slop in it. Uh, this is like battle grade stuff here. I don't know. I think it's in the hundreds of dollars, maybe. I don't think it's. I don't know how much it is. But okay. then, see, so you get your three legs like this. They roll up, and you can put this in a little pouch. You know what I mean? So we're talking about secondary equipment, right? So if you're gonna be, a lot of times in situations are less than ideal in terms of a firing position, right? So you can't see over the reeds if you're like down by some reeds or some tall grass or you're in a forest and you have to get the weapon a little bit higher off the ground what am i doing here then you can use something like this and uh, get the the rifle a little off the ground it has an adapter for a picatinny rail actually uh for up here and then it just snaps on with a, a lever as they say over there across the pond or friends over there you know and so and you can deploy this a lot quicker than i'm doing it i'm just like rusty and talking at the same time so basically there's that and then you put your death pod feet on the bottom like this see and then this sucker i mean like you can watch the review you can really lean into it and it's pretty heavy duty so i don't know if you can buy these if you guys can find where to buy them let me know i did have links in the old uh video of where to go the website and uh, i know for a while there they even had it like secured on some of that stuff like you couldn't get into it without a password I don't know why. It's like top secret or something. Yeah. Anyways, that's the death pod. Did we, oh, we got all three feet on. And then you mount. Oh, man. It's, and you can stab people with this thing, too. Yeah. It's a weapon. Secondary weapon. Raw, raw, raw. Hey, remember the movie The Langoliers? No. Stephen King movie The Langoliers? Raw, raw, raw. You don't remember? It's like monsters. <laughs> they travel into the, in, the, the time in between time. And there's the monsters that eat everything. Yeah. Sorry. Just having flashbacks to the 90s there when I used to watch TV. When I was... Oh, you guys want to see some cool binoculars? Binoculars? So what does Rex use for binoculars out in the field? Uh, this is a classic that a lot of guys use. The Steiner Military 8x30Rs. They got a reticle in them. Uh, that reticle ain't going to be good for like precision rifle applications, but if you're directing field artillery, very handy. Um, how about these things? These are nice. Remember these? Did you guys see the review on these? These are the Dr. 7x40Bs, um, made in Jena, Germany. I think they're called, Schwar the, the video review is called Schwarzenegger Grade Binoculars or something. And it's got me looking like Schwarzenegger driving a car, and I'm looking at stuff with binoculars. It's like not one of my most popular videos, but if you do want really nice binoculars, these are really nice, like stupid nice. And uh, they're military contract binoculars made for the East German army. And uh, it's like Zeiss quality binoculars, except way more heavy duty. So it's awesome. That's, these are my favorite binoculars. So if you could only have one kind of binoculars, that's what they'd be. 
Yeah, well, this is actually my one kind of, well, I got two kind of binoculars. This is my two kind of binoculars. This one's lighter and smaller, but this one is like, you can see really, you can direct rifle fire with these things. You can see that clearly. They're only seven power, but you can, you can see trace a lot of times. They're really handy. I was uh, out east shooting with some dudes and uh, I just stood behind them with the binoculars. You know what I mean? They're shooting through the forest doing uh, keyhole and loophole stuff. And I just stood behind them with the binoculars. And I could see it like, I don't know, 600 or whatever it was. Not super far, but you can see very clearly what's going on. Good binoculars. Uh, yeah, watch the Schwarzenegger grade binoculars review. I'll paste all the stuff after the live deal is over on the bottom of the page. And, so, or the, what are they, the script? No, commentaries? Yep. I'll paste it in the commentary so you guys can see what all this neat stuff is because that's the backup equipment, some of it. Yeah, pretty fun, huh? Do you have any other questions? Well, I think Warsaw Patriot will explode if he doesn't get to ask you a question. I'm ready. So we're, Warsaw we're, Patriot? We're open, Warsaw. What's your question? <laughs> he commented like 20 times. Man, I almost went to Warsaw. I was like 20 miles from there, but I didn't drive there. I was too tired. Yeah? Mm-hmm. He Where'd he go? Yeah. Come on, Warsaw. Waiting Give on the you. program, dude. What's oh, another bro. one while we're waiting? How about the second binocular was the Steiner military. Okay. He said LOL. There's a difference between the uh Steiner, what's the military and what's the other one? The tactical or I forget what they are. The military is actually quite a bit different in terms of how the prisms are made and all that stuff. They're quite a bit nicer. Um, they're, what's they're, they're, they're quite, they're like twice or three times of money, but they're really nice. What's your favorite surplus rifle bolt action rifle? Mm, the 1898 Craig Jorgensen, which is directly behind me on the wall, which I have covered for some reason with a black curtain that's not covering the wall all the way. It's totally, um, a studio actually. Yeah. It's that's my studio. Wall. It's a, yeah, that's the studio. That's curtain. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. 1898 Craig Jorgensen. Who makes your jacket? This one? Mm -hmm. I don't know. Can you read it? Uh, made in Indonesia. Oh, for God's sake. I shouldn't have read that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's not made in Switzerland or something. I'm like a normal guy, like poor guy or whatever. So I have to buy Malaysian. Where? Indonesia? Indonesia. Yeah, it's made in Indonesia. So that's all I can. Yeah. Sorry. Got it. Feelings cool. on Celtic shotgun. I had a KSG. Did I do a review on that? I never did. I got a lot of footage of me running KSGs. Uh, you can watch a video where I'm shooting with the Aussie comes to America and shoots guns. It's in my playlist, range videos maybe or something. But me and my buddy uh, Andrew are running around on a gun range shooting all kinds of stuff. And we had the KSG. And uh, <laughs> They asked what kind of knife you carry. This one. Yeah, the Ontario Knife Works uh, Raider Bowie. Or a Cold Steel Tonto. Like a, you know what I mean? That's the other one that I actually use more. But this is actually, if you've got to go out in the woods, this thing is awesome. You can like, yeah, it's awesome. Mm -hmm. uh, what was I just talking about? KSG. Yeah. So the KSG is cool. It's an awesome configuration in design and concept. It sucks to run, in my opinion. They're sticky. you got to get really Western pumping them. Um, they're very fussy in exactly how you get the, the shells stuck into the tubes. Uh, you got to clip, click over the little deal. And uh, even if you know what you're doing when you're running it, like it's not nearly as smooth to operate as just an old 870 or a Mossberg is what I would prefer in a war or in a situation in the night where you have to load the shotgun. Like the K, I would not trust the KSG to be 100% reliable because you might get something stuck or uh, they're, they're a little goofy, but they're awesome. They right. look really cool. They're super handy. They hold a lot of shells. But in all honesty, if you get smooth operating a normal pump shotgun, you can run and reload on the fly. You know what I mean? You can always stick more in there as you're moving. And that's how we usually run them, you know, as you're running in a circle or whatever with them things. That's my opinion what, on the KSG. What's your everyday carry weapon? Uh, Glock 27, usually. Or a 38 uh, Smith & Wesson Airweight. Or a USP 45, depending on how much clothes I'm wearing. <laughs> How long have you been shooting? 30 years. Forever. Yep, 30 years. Dun, dun, dun. And I'm pretty young. <laughs> I started early. No, the old man had a shooting revolver, single action, center fire revolvers and rifles when I was like four. So, One and that was, an, that was every weekend kind of deal, it seemed like, so. 
the CZ75 made in the Czech Republic? Oh, yeah, the Czeska Zebrowska 75B. Is he asking us that? or? I don't know. I don't know. He's asking exactly. You know that the Eastern... Classes. Actually, Guns and Gear Network. They're asking about classes? About our classes. Yeah, there's a class coming up. Uh, if, if those who don't know about it, RX-17 is what he's talking about. Uh, there is one that is still actually available if you guys are able to get to Dallas at the end of the month. Uh, what is it? This uh, what was July 11th right now? Yeah. So it's on like the last weekend of um, July. And if you guys can make it there, it's a world-class training event. There's nothing else like it. It's actually pretty unique. It's very different than not saying it's like the other ones are horrible. I'm just saying that you're not going to find nothing like this except for our class. It's, going to, it's very comprehensive, a lot of unique perspectives. So come dig it. Yeah. A lot of people really had fun at the first Seriously? one. Seriously? Okay. This is just me going on about it. But RX-17 was a blast. We had a lot of fun. We met a lot of people. I mean, just being in a group of people that are that like-minded. Yeah, there's a lot of cool people there. I mean, it's awesome. So if you do come to a class, expect to have a lot of fun. We'll all be there again. Uh, Lou and I will also be coming. You'll get to meet the crew. Um, we like to have, you know, sometimes people show up that you're not expecting. Yep. So expect the unexpected. <laughs> yeah, uh, some of the top guys in the industry are there. Uh, so if you want to, especially if you are in the industry of long range rifles and you're watching this, like if you have a company you're trying to get set, or if you're in a tier one rifle or optics industry, this is the kind of place you probably want to come get a ticket to. It's like a mini shot show for precision rifle fire stuff, like uh, extreme range command shot stuff. Uh, so if you want to get in on that deal, it's a one of a kind deal in the world. And uh, we had incredible reviews from the professionals who came. They thought that they'd never seen anything like that before. Absolutely. And it's not just Rex talking. I'm just no. one guy. Although I do talk a lot at that deal. We do. <laughs> it's an instructional course. So it Rex talk, talks a lot. Yeah. What? We talk about it. We talk about how to link all the sniper one on one classes together and how to prioritize the information and balance it out and implement it into a viable shooting system that you can take into the field. And it's a preliminary course that we like people to take before they do the live fire courses, which are now available at rexreviews.org. They just went up, right? Yeah. We finally did the public posting. If you want to do the live fire course shooting with Rex, it's going to be in Dallas, Texas area at uh, when's it? end of September. Yes, end of September. It is up on the website. So a lot of people are asking about actual fire classes where you get to go out and shoot. Those yep. are posted now. <laughs> yeah, we'll get you squared away. You guys are going to be yeah. awesome. Uh, if you have any tiny little microscopic quirks that are maybe screwing up your long range game, we'll find them and we'll straighten them out. Uh, we, we're going to have a, a, a good amount of expertise there. Uh, we're going to show you how to spot, like for the other guy, we're going to tell you how to communicate with the spotter. Uh, we're going to tell you, uh, we're, we're going to show you how to do the advanced precision marksmanship. And then we're going to show you how to do like advanced firing solutions and, uh, true your ballistics on your computers so that you can make shots on the first shot and or maybe the second awesome. shot. I do want to make a note too, and this is just on my end, on the back end. I do the, the web stuff, guys. Um, we are still looking for um, possible sponsors for that event. So if you're interested, if you have a business in the industry and you want to sponsor or you just want to help out, email us at yeah. T-Rex.Reyes at gmail.com. People are welcome to participate. Up. The more, the merrier. Makes it more interesting. We got some really cool people coming there right now, actually. Um, Axial Precision is going to be one outfit. They're a brand new proprietary company uh, out on the market. I don't know if they're public. I think they're public. They got a website now, mm -hmm. and I think they're selling rifles. Um, but uh, they're going to be there to explain um, how everything needs to be actually aligned with the bore and the chamber and the bolt and the firing pin and everything's got to be on a straight line. That's a, a, we were just doing a video, um, and I haven't released this one yet either, but I'm going to soon. We're shooting a 6.5 Creedmoor at a mile, yeah. which is beyond the effective range of that cartridge, in my opinion, because it's going subsonic. Uh, so it gets through that sonic barrier very effectively. And if everything's actually aligned with the rifle, uh, the bullet doesn't have any radical yaw initially coming out of there and it's not deformed too terribly from being asymmetrical and coming into the rifling at a crooked angle if you get everything perfect that's when you can really up your chances of getting through the transonic zone without any kind of destabilization dynamically and so that's the kind of stuff we're going to talk about at rx17 
Uh, also, too, if people are feeling like they're left in the dust at ARC-17, because it's like way beyond what a normal course is in terms of information and a detail, um, we do, and I insist that when we do this, I get very, very into depth. Our instructors get very, very into depth. Um, but we do come back and translate it at the end into the colloquial English for normal people. So, for example, we went into very good detail. Oh, I made it blurry. Sorry. We went into very, very deep detail about internal ballistics and harmonic vibra vibration patterns and how everything needs to be like totally monolithic from the action to the buttstock, all this stuff. And people, maybe some people thought that was too much information, but honestly, what we said at the end was like, the heart of the matter is everything needs to be tight or whatever, for example. And we go through all kinds of stuff from optics to rifles, equipment selection, and, uh, for folks who think that they're going to spend too much money on that deal, so if you buy a grand piano and hand it to your your kid and tell them, okay, now they know how to play the piano because they have a good piano. No. No. That's or if you, if you get a guitar, I know a lot of dudes would buy a guitar, and I said this before, um, in a nice amp, and you don't, you're not a guitar player yet. <laughs> you have a nice guitar lean in the corner, but when someone asks you to play it, you might be a little embarrassed, uh, and that's okay because without guitar lessons. Who can expect you to learn anything that quickly, right? It takes years to be self-taught. It'll take you 10 years to get uh, to the point that a student who has a really good teacher on the guitar can get in one year. So for 10 years of screwing around the guitar by yourself, even if you're watching internet videos, there's a lot of details to play in the guitar. Like the pick, you can tweak it just so it sticks out below your thumb. You can do the chirps and the squeaks, and it gives it that cutting edge tone and the vibrato and just all the details that you need an instructor to sit there and kind of explain to you. Um, that's why people take guitar lessons. And they'll spend thousands of dollars over the course of a year taking guitar lessons. Uh, but yet grown men are shy sometimes and grown women even to maybe take rifle lessons because it's a guy thing why chromosome prevents it but i'll tell you what we're a lot of fun and this is a course for like advanced shooters so if you're a hardcore shooter already uh you don't need to be embarrassed coming here some of the top guys in their classes in the world were at this last one and a lot of people maybe didn't recognize who was who was sitting all over the the room it's funny because of different circles too some of the guys are like really into the precision competition world mm -hmm. and they're like oh yeah so and so is here but they missed out on this whole nother world of other guys that's good at what they do exactly. and i ain't even Hunters, saying who they are we've got but um others. no <laughs> if you guys in it the cool thing too is you get to mingle and mix with these guys you get to meet them and then there's a facebook page now you know for the guys that were the alumni of that class yeah. and also you get in on the crowd and we're going to be throwing parties in the future too for all the alumni uh yes, so it'll be a continued investment and they'll be like basically <laughs> just barely above free just to cover the cost of the barbecue and the music if we have it. We'll Absolutely. take over someone's ranch someplace, you know, once a year and, and we'll throw a big old party. Real people yeah. doing real things, having real conversation. Yeah. yeah. So like if, barbecue. And also it, it it definitely helps with the Rex Reviews project to help fund our operation. We spent like uh, multiple tens of thousands of dollars trying to put all this stuff together over the years in terms of equipment reviews and uh, gasoline and travel expenses to get everything put together so it's helpful and we appreciate it but not to beat a dead horse that deal but if you can make it the end of july there's another course and it might be the last one of this style we do yeah. because people were saying it's way above most people's heads so if you're a serious shooter or you, you want to become one this is the course you want to get in on we're going to restructure a lot of these instructional courses to start from more of a beginner's Beginner. level because a lot of people want to learn from scratch how to shoot a rifle so we have to do advanced uh, marksmanship classes and um, we're going to refine it we're going to take it into more digestible pieces is what i'm saying uh not that it's a beginner level class that we're going to set up but it's going to be an advanced level class zooming in specifically on all the infinite complexity of for example marksmanship and natural lay of the rifle and how the 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 platform is the shooting platform getting everything squared away harmonically uh, that's stuff you're not going to learn in any other classes because we're going to really just zoom in on that and then after you take that you'll be okay to take the next level class where we get into ballistics and uh, developing tables in the field with your actual rifle that you'll have and we'll chew it and make sure you have tables or your computer perfectly calibrated to your system and then we'll uh, push it with extreme range uh, precision classes and proprietary classes after that so it's going to be a big deal but if you want to get in on the full compression information the the big widespread uh plethora 
of all the little candies and pieces of gold, RX-17 is going to be that course. It's uh, two days and one night, and we all get we, there's enough time for us to hang out, and we all eat together and have fun, and you know have a brewski at the restaurant and stuff like that. So come hang out; it'd be fun. Seriously, okay. So I have to ask you this question. I have literally been biting my tongue that long, guys, but I'm gonna ask it. Lots of people want me to make sure I ask you. Uh, what are your to, thoughts okay. on Tremor Three Radicals? Tremor Three Radical. Tremor Three Radicals. Go. Okay, Tremor 3 Radical, uh, according to everyone who I'm talking to, and I know one of the guys who's a big proponent of that, who actually is a patent writer on it, I think maybe. I wasn't supposed to say that. I'm sorry. I don't know. But I, I know some of the guys who helped develop that thing, and uh, they're smart. So you have to be pretty well, – I'm not going to say you have to be smart, but um, it does take a little bit of learning how to use it. But once you use it, um, there's a lot of high-speed guys using that thing. Uh, I haven't yet done a review on it because I've never had one in my possession. I do a different style of shooting. Uh, but those are very effective uh, for all round shooting for long range if you know how to use it though. But you have to be a little bit of a scientist. You have to understand what the hell you're doing with that thing to make it work. You don't just, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah, because it's a different system. It's, it's kind of thinking outside the box in some ways, but it's, it seems like a smart, but I don't want to bite off more than I, I can chew. That would probably be a whole review unto itself explaining how those things work and how to implement them. And if you guys want to do that sometime, yeah, that could happen. What's your favorite color? My favorite color? Mm -hmm. Classically, I always would say blue. blue. But I like different colors. All right. I like different colors. Okay. Uh, should the Egan is think it's kind of same? a violet color? Really? Like a dark, like like, a, like a ultraviolet kind of bluish, mm -hmm. like the bug zappers. I kind of want to fly into one of them things. If I was a bug, I'd totally fly into a bug zapper. Guaranteed. I probably would too. It'd be I a like trip. Shiny stuff. Purple haze is in my uh, brain. Should Egan buy a little badger 22 long range for 200 M? 2,000 meters and in? Yes. That's okay. an incredible choice for that. If you can master the 22 long rifle at 22 or 2,000 meters, if it can go that far, which I don't think it can, um, you will be awesome. So that will maximize your effectiveness mastering the 22 at 2,000 meters. If you can pull that off, you're the best guy I've known. So, yes, please do that. So, uh, what are your thoughts on Brandon, a.k.a. the AK guy who built an Ask Sniper rifle chambered in 50 BMG? I don't know what he's talking about, unfortunately. I'm sorry, guys. Yeah. Rex, what is your opinion on every product Product in every <laughs> scope? Enter it now. All, yeah, of the, all of the products. <laughs> uh, I'm dead. <laughs> Watch the scope hierarchy videos. Right. Them tell you the whole opinion right there. Uh, holy peeps, reloading belted magnums. Long lasting non belted that are not very common versus belted that don't last long. That's a disjointed question. That uh, it's a good question. I think. Let's see if Re I can read it. Reloading belted magnums. Yeah. I use belted magnum, 7 millimeter Remington magnum, 300 Winchester magnum. Them are good cartridges. But uh, what's long-lasting, non-belted, that are not very common versus belted that don't last? Well, if you just ease off on your pressure, a non-belted cartridge is fine. You know what I mean? Or you can, like a 338 Lapua is long-lasting. That's a very thick case wall on those. Uh, they doubled the thickness on the 416 Rigby. It was originally kind of designed on. Uh, so it's a slightly rebated case, if I'm not mistaken. Um, it was a 416 neck down to 338, but then they thickened the web of the case in the backside, especially because of the pressure issues, because it's really hot cartridge. And if you have a super thick case like that, um, pretty tough little cartridge. I mean, I've reloaded mine like a lot. I don't remember how many times, half a dozen. I neck size though. And I don't load, and I don't load them stupid hot. So a lot of that is about not loading stuff too hot. For us wheel gun guys, wheel guns. If you were going to have a do all wheel gun for secondary, what would your choices be? A do all? Well, okay. There's two different guys of wheel guns in two different categories. I like the 73 single action army, a five and a half inch barrel or seven and a half inch barrel. Actually, the five and a half inch barrel is a really nice balance for kind of like actually doing a lot of shooting. But the seven and a half inch barrel works really good. You stick it in a sash. You know what I mean? And you don't need a holster. You just stick it in your pants or in your belt. 
and it just balances nicely in there. So I've grown grown up on the seven and a half inch barrel uh, Colt single. You silly blurry little bugger. See, I almost cussed, but I caught myself. <laughs> uh, but yeah, that's that's what I would use there. Is that uh, seven and a half inch barrel seventy three single action Colt? That's classic. But if you're talking uh, double action revolvers, I like Smith and Wesson six eighty six is what I use in a six inch barrel. Actually, the four inch barrel is awesome too. If you're going to carry it like as a duty weapon, um, there's actually like guys who still carry those in certain circles, like in serious circles. Um, the Smith and Wesson double action three fifty seven. So you'd be surprised what you see out there. Uh, if you could only build one AR-10 style rifle in 6.5 Creedmoor for target shooting as well as hunting, what barrel length would you go with? 20, 22, or 24 inches? 6.5 Creedmoor? Well, if you're going to go proprietary, it's going to be a special purpose rifle. The point of that round is going to be to shoot at long range. You're going to want a little more velocity to help you out. I'd go with the 24 inch barrel. Uh, if you get it like a more stubby cartridge, like a 308, then a 20 inch is plenty fine because... Uh, but a 6.5 is neck down a little more. It might need a little more barrel to get that performance. And if you're spending more money on the ammo to get higher external ballistic performance, then go with a little more length on your barrel. Okay. Rex, could you comment on hand loading for precision AR-15s? Are there specific breast preparation techniques, i.e. bumping shoulders minimally, that should be used for precision AR like bolt guns? Hmm. Good question. You know, when it comes to reloading, guys, I got some videos on that. You can watch those. I don't get too radical crazy because in my experience, it's really the shooter that's the main thing. I can, I mean, if I can get five shots in an air on a pinky nail at 100 yards, I'm totally happy, totally happy. And I've done that just with following the instructions exactly as listed in the RCBS dies. And they're nothing fancy. It's just a standard die and uh, the reloading manual. I just follow those instructions like the Bible, exactly verbatim. I pick a medium load. I don't even experiment with loads. If you have good uh, quality control, like in terms of what you're doing, and if, you know, basic reloading stuff will get you incredible precision in a good rifle with a good shooter who understands how to get the rifle harmonically sound on a good shooting platform that's consistent. That's the trick. Um, a lot of guys are screwing around with reloading while the rifle ain't properly deployed, you know, <laughs> on a platform. Uh, that's something you learn at RX-17 if you come. So come come check it out. It'll save you at least through $2,000 worth of ammo and stuff and reloading stuff. And scopes that you thought were broke. So Or scopes that you thought would work and they didn't. And then you had to buy another $800 scope that didn't work. And then you change models to a different one that still didn't work. So we're going to save you at least 10 grand by taking the class. Kind of like the guitar player taking guitar lessons. I'm just saying. I got to I got to do this cuz I think it's kind of funny cuz I'm answering these in my head as I'm reading them but I'm going to guess Rex's answer to these and he'll let me know if I'm right. Oh fun, I'm ready. Okay. Uh so let's see here. Uh the red dot on pistols? No. Correct. All right. Yeah. Um do do I get to say anything or are we just going to You, you just them? you just let me know if I'm right or not. Yeah. Thank no you. red dots on pistols for me. No. Nope. Um, bah, bah, bah. where's that vortex? A pistol, you just whip it out and start shooting. Exactly. If they're, they're that closer, for... where you need your pistol, that's point shooting. That's where you practice your flash sight picture or whatever them guys call it. I don't know. You just point at the target and kill the targets. It's too close to use the sights. If you got to use sights, then you can aim. It's not a big deal. Any thoughts? Oh, I if don't you know, even if you know practice, I mean, I guess I practiced for a long time. Yeah, you you guys are watching my long range pistol shooting video, weren't you? Yes. Remember the old one? Yeah. From like a few years ago. Me and my little beard and my ponytail out by the river. Yes. Yeah, just like. It's a great video. You guys should actually watch it. Long range 22 pistol shooting precision. He was hit. It's incredible. Nah, he's got the bank. I he's got aiming. the bank on the other side. And he's like, he's an old cowboy dude, you know, like Me? he is. Um, <laughs> but he was shooting across to the other side, like over to this bank. You can barely see it on the camera. She and thought it was pretty cool. Plinkin, I think it's, it's what us old aiming guys used to call aiming the pistol. But we showed on a video for those who are unacquainted with aiming pistols. But it's fun. We had a lot of fun in that video. And even talk about which bear some good stuff in there too. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. Which bear defense gun if you had to defend yourself against a bear? I would get as big of a handgun as possible because a grizzly dude, like I lived in a place one time where 30 miles from my house, two people would get killed by bears at least. 
once a year. You know what I mean? Like within like a driving range or half a tank of gas, there'd be two or three guys eaten by bears every year, grizzly bears. Uh, during elk season, when you shoot the rifle, they would run straight for the gunshot because they thought that was a dinner bell gut pile, right? And then they'd see the hunter there gutting his elk and they would just kill that guy and eat him too. And so that's kind of a bad deal. Grizzly, like preferably you want a full powered rifle and a guy on perimeter watch. That's what you need is a buddy. So when you're gutting that thing, you have a buddy standing there locked and loaded, waiting for a grizzly bear to come running at you, okay? Especially in that kind of scenario. A shotgun would be a good choice too, uh, in with, uh, you know, heavy buckshot or something like that, you know, or, or uh, you know, but uh, if you got to have a pistol, if that's your only line of defense, as big as possible. That's where your 500 Smith & Wesson Magnum would be good, or the 460 would be really good with a heavy, solid bullet. It's bullet choice. One guy got eaten by a bear 35 miles from where I lived, and uh, they didn't find him until two years later when they found uh, the bear that they finally killed was trying to kill another hunter guy, and that had that bear had six 44 Magnum bullets right in its face. And they only went in this far because the guy thought that hollow points would be the best idea for a grizzly bear. And he was mistaken. He should use solids, some heavy, hard cast lead, like 300 grain plus bullets in a 44 loaded, very stout. That's what I would use for a bear or something bigger, like a 460, 454 Casul, 480, whatever, 500 Magnum, something like that. And I wouldn't even be happy then. I would be, I mean, a 500 Magnum would be pretty comforting. It's almost like a, full powered rifle, you know, um, but uh, 44 Magnum is kind of wussy on the scale of things. It's not even as powerful as a 223 in, in terms of foot pounds and stuff. So okay. yeah, grizzly bears are scary, man. They are scary. Ace mm -hmm. Taffy, calm down. Just huh? calm down. Me? No, Ace Taffy needs to calm down. And we're going to continue with the questions. <laughs> <laughs> 40 millimeter mic mic. Yep, 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 yep. That'll do it. Except the problem is the grizzly bear is too close. Did you know that those 40 millimeter high explosive rounds have a centripetal fuse? If you just shot it at like point blank, it would just hit the bear and that's it. It wouldn't explode. So actually a 40 mic mic would only work good at beyond the range. They got to spin a certain amount of times or whatever it is. Do they? No, they don't spin. Uh, they have a, they got a fuse in them. That's like a proximity fuse. I don't know how the hell them things work. I just know they don't go off at point blank usually unless something's messed up. Okay. One of you guys can tell me how that works. I wasn't one of those uh, grenadier guys or something. So, Tell me everything you know about 7mm 08. That's a great cartridge. I like that. In fact, the next custom rifle I build in a medium class rifle, I think I might do that. I like that cartridge. Yep, it's efficient. It's like a... Okay. Yeah, it's good. Sorry. It'll be good. 0 to 14 or 0 to 1500 meters without heavy recoil and all that stuff. Good round. Who carries a 500 SW on a walk? Well, they make little small ones. <laughs> I know. I, I always carried, when I was up in the mountains, man, I always carried a heavy-duty revolver and then some backup. Right. I actually carried a rifle usually, like a AK folding stock with a sling. That's actually what I carried. And I'd load, uh, I'd load hard ball in it. That's that I would be comfortable with. If a grizzly bear was trying to eat you and he had an AK, or sometimes they carry an FAL, seriously. Um, cause they're up there, man. That's where you start getting in, into the comfort zone. What are your thoughts on the VEPR 308? The Vepper? Yes. As yeah, a, them are cool. As a DMR. DMR. You know, if you do that properly, there's a guy who I'm going to interview pretty soon and I'm going to send off one of my Segas to him. Uh, and he does those things up real good. And he gets the receivers trued and squared off and redoes the pins and does the barrel tension properly. He understands the flexing of the, the rod on the gas piston to where it like creates a harmonic problem. So he gets that all properly adjusted. And you can get AKs to shoot pretty darn good. And the Vepper is a good choice, actually. I, that's a question for Robski on AK Operators Union. Robski is a cool guy. Go talk to Robski. He will get you squared away on that kind of stuff. But if you absolutely got to use a, an AK or something for a DMR, uh, I think he likes AK-74s. I think he talked about the Vepper too, but I don't know. You'll have to ask him. He's the expert on that deal. So what are your, what's your opinion on precision rifle competition in various formats? PRS, precision? Mammoths. Yeah. I think that those are all good. They teach a guy how to um, 
manipulate the rifle in various ways. They teach you how to go through a quick firing solution solution process to get on target quickly. So for they're very good crossover for most DMR applications, right? Where you got to kind of move and shoot quickly. Uh, so on the modern battlefield in the war on terror, it's uh, generally maybe kind of compatible for training for that kind of a scenario. Um, for a like command shot application where you have to make the first shot first kill kind of deal, the classic sniper applications uh, where you maximize your psychological effect on the battlefield by just shooting one round and being gone. Um, then there's other, I don't know, you know, the competition shooting world, there's so much different stuff you can do. Um, but we, we teach a little bit different style of shooting. Actually, one of the guys we're going to have teaching is a PRS guy, and he's pretty successful. Uh, so we are going to cover that kind of stuff. So if you want to do the RX-17 and the follow-up live fire courses, we're going to teach you how to do that as well. But I think that everything has its place. It's not that I don't like one deal. I like BB gun competition. That's incredibly helpful for learning how to shoot. And that all carries over. It's all crossover. So anything you're doing to shoot and learn how to do it better is great. But don't I wouldn't get too wrapped up in one deal. Um, if you plan on using it in the real world, world, if you're only going to be in sports, that's cool to kind of latch on to one system. But if you memorize all the cheat co codes for one specific game, you might not be as well-rounded as is needed in a actual situation. So I would recommend people do a diversity of training and shooting styles. They should be hunting. They should hunting is a whole different ball game from precision uh, shooting in the target world because you got a live target. It's wily. You got to sneak up on it. Unknown ranges moving at unknown variable rates. It's not like a thing that's on a fixed thing that you can memorize. Um, so hunting is way different. Um, planking is good, going out by yourself, running through all kinds of different drills, and participating in different kinds of shooting sports are going to make you a good, well-rounded, long-range shooter. Um, so that's my advice there. And if you do want to master one deal, go ahead and master it. That's cool. And that'll teach you a lot of stuff really good. But PRS is really good for learning actually how to shoot the rifle pretty good from various positions quickly. So that's that's good crossover for other things. So uh, thoughts on 7 millimeter RUM, please. Yeah, the 7 millimeter Remington Ultra Magnum is an incredible special purpose rifle. I would not use that for just target shooting or learning how to do long range. If a guy wants to learn how to do long, and this is something I explained in ARC-17 to the class. A lot of people... Um, have a lot of hunting rifles and special purpose cartridges. Like any kind of big magnum like that is a special purpose cartridge. That one's purpose probably being extreme long range precision shooting, where you're going to only shoot one or two rounds, or like long range hunting, where you're only going to shoot a couple rounds at a time. Otherwise, you're going to have excessive barrel wear. You're going to burn the throat right out of there. Uh, you're going to have excessive blast and recoil. It's going to be expensive. It's going to be uncomfortable to shoot. Uh, so if you're learning to shoot, a 308 or something in a medium class, 6.5 Creedmoor, 243. Very, very good choice to do it that way. And then master the art doing it that way. And then the crossover into your new system is going to be a lot easier um, on your big rifle. Then you can select the cartridge that you need. You can uh, true your ballistic tables and get them exactly perfect. Learn the idiosyncrasies of that particular system. But you won't have to spend thousands of rounds on that rifle. Then, you know what I mean? So I would have. In that case, I'd have two rifles. If you're going to get a 7 millimeter RUM, I would have a smaller one to master that first and then get the RUM, and then you'll be able to drive that thing without having to wear it out six times because <laughs> they're hard on barrels. Ah, uh, okay. Do you like AK rifles like yeah. Arsenal's? Yeah, they're, they're awesome. I love AKs. I got an AK right over there. It's one of my uh, office defense systems. I got a lot of stuff laying around. Uh, no matter which way I go, I'm within like three feet of something that's good. Uh, 308 versus the 6.5 Creedmoor for a new shooter just starting out. Either one of those is great. 6.5 Creedmoor has way better external ballistics, less recoil, easier on the wind. However, 308 is going to be a lot more mild in terms of barrel wear. Uh, ammo is probably going to be a little easier to find in general. Uh, 308 is going to be better for World War III zombie apocalypse because they're going to have more ammo. Um, Three weights a great training rifle because it teaches you the science better. Because 
like it's more drastically affected by atmospheric changes. So your wind deflection and stuff is going to be way worse. <laughs> it's going to be a worse cartridge than a 6.5 Creedmoor, but you'll be able to train inside 600 and 800 yards and have the same effects in terms of training and learning as you would with a 6.5 Creedmoor trying to shoot at like 1400 or 1200. So, because the max effective range of a three weights a lot closer. So it's better for training in my opinion. Uh, but if you actually need to hit the target, then 6.5 better <laughs> for by a long shot. I see an Jaeger giving you the eye. Yeah, he gave me the eyeball. He's actually a nice guy. I, I wish a lot of people got to meet him in person. Like, I got to hang out with him a little bit. He's a good guy. He just got a really abrasive style about him, and he's wired different. So but I, I won't beat that dead horse either. That's I understand great. that, you know, some guys are turned off by the abrasiveness, but he's cool. Do you happen to know Creedmoor or Ace by chance? They keep going on about yes. some money stuff. I think they're just talking crap. I don't know. But, yeah, guys, we wanted to do that quick video upload talking about uh, secondary systems, and we got to talk about all kinds of other stuff. Another reminder, too, if you guys want to do that class at the end of July, it's probably going to be the last one, especially in that area, for quite a long time. Um, we might do some more similarly configured classes. They might be a little more concise, uh, less comprehensive, um, or maybe, I don't know. We're going to see what happens in the future, but we can't guarantee we're going to do that exact class. Maybe we will. Uh, we're playing it by ear. We have no idea what the future holds, but if you want to get on something like that, come meet some of the cool guys in the industry and uh, hang out with us. It'd be awesome. And then you get in on a live fire too, if you want to do the veterans live fire. Rexreviews.org is our website. That's a training tab under there shows you what classes are not sold out and uh, come hang out. All right. I guess that's, that's all of the real questions we got coming. Yep. In. We'll catch you around guys. The class is going to be in Texas and then the live fire will be. They're both in the Dallas, Texas area. Texas. The class itself is going to be at the Bass Pro Shops in Grapevine, Texas, right next to the DFW airport. The live fire will be within quick driving range of that area. So it's all on the Eventbrite where the links are on rexreviews.org. It shows you the exact location, the time, the place, and everything like that. So all right. we hope to see you guys there. If not, we'll catch you on the next one if we do another one. So. Catch Thanks, you guys. Take care.